a short break from Genesis as we've been doing. We get the Communion Sunday to look more explicitly at Christ and the cross, what he's done for us. John 15, we're going to take 1 through 17. It's page 1071 in the Blue Bible, if you're using that one. I've titled this message, Abide in My Love. Abide in My Love. And specifically, we're going to zero in on verse 9, but I'm going to read the whole 1 through 17 for context here. People of God, hear the holy, inspired, inerrant, infallible, authoritative word of God. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I've spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me, and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch that withers, and the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I've kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I've spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, than someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing, but I've called you friends. For all I've heard from my father, I've made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide so that whatever you ask the father in my name, he may give it to you. These things I command you so that you will love one another. Let's pray and ask God for his help. Lord, a lot in here, but Lord, as we zero in in verse 9, Lord, I pray you would just blow our idea of your love for us completely out of the water. Lord, that you would transform us from the inside out, that you'd fill me with your Holy Spirit to preach your word truthfully and with great power. Lord, open our eyes, open our ears, open our hearts, enlarge our hearts with your love. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, sometimes we need to do something and we lack the motivation to do it. At least it happens to me. Ever been there? Maybe you need to mow the yard or, or go do some exercise or get some schoolwork done and you just don't feel like it. You ever feel like that? And then something comes into your mind that changes your motivation. Some information from the outside comes in there and kind of transforms your whole mindset to help you do what you should have been doing already. You know, if I don't cut the grass, the grass is going to get pretty high. Then there might be more ticks and snakes hiding in our grass. And then my three little boys might be out there getting bit by ticks and snakes. I think I'll go cut the grass. Or maybe I should do some exercise or eat a little better because I don't want my boys not having a dad to wrestle them in the evenings and body slam them on the couch and tickle them. How will they go without that? Or maybe I need to do some schoolwork so I don't fail. And waste money and time and those kind of things, right? So information that can change our mindset and then action happens. Flows from the inside out, you could say. And there's something in this passage today that can drastically change your mindset like never before. I mean, the passage talks about keeping God's commandments and, and bearing much fruit. It talks about all of that, but let's be honest, sometimes that's hard to do with all the distractions of this world around us, all the things that get in the way of that. 
Plus some things that God tells us to do, they're pretty hard. And sometimes we just don't feel like it. You ever feel like that before? You ever been there? But when you see this one thing in here today, and you get a larger understanding of it, and it grows within you, you can, you can see it and grasp it, it'll transform your mindset. Whether you've been with the Lord, walking with Him for 50 years or five days, it is so important to know. You say, what is it? <laughs> I'm not going to tell you yet. You know, <laughs> But how we're going to get there is we're going to break this down into three ways. We're going to break this passage down into abide in Christ, amazing love, and a joyful life. And within that, we're going to see this, right? Abide in Christ, amazing love, and a joyful life. That's where we're headed. Let's start with abide in Christ. Let's zero in on verse 9, as I told you. As the Father has loved me, Jesus says, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. That's what we're zeroing in on right there. That verse right there, if you can grasp more of what that is saying, it will change your life. The Lord has been wrecking my life in a good way with that verse in the last few months. It's huge. But before we zero in, let's, let's uh, take the 30,000 foot view of this passage. Let's kind of get up in the airplane and look down upon it as a whole to kind of get it all in context. You see... If you notice as I read that, there's a word that kept coming up time and time again, right? And when God wants to get our eyes set on something in Scripture, He will repeat it. Repetition, repetition, repetition. You often do that, often do that, often do that. He repeats things. They just go, whoa, what's that? That keeps coming up here. Circle that. That is a key thing here. And He does that with what word did we see it with? The word abide. Abide. Look there at the beginning of verse 4 in case you didn't believe me. Abide in me, Jesus says. Middle of verse 4. Abides in the vine. End of verse 4. Abide in me. Middle of verse 5. Abide in me. Beginning portion of verse 6. Abide in me. I'm going to keep going. Verse 7. Abide in me. Middle of verse 7. My words abide in you. The end of verse 9. Abide in my love. Middle of verse 10. Abide in my love. End of verse 10, abide in his love. In the middle of verse 16, should abide. Now you believe me. There's a slight possibility God may want us to concentrate on a certain word here. It's the word abide. So what is it? What is abiding? Well, it's translated from the Greek word meno, which means this. To remain, to stay, to reside. To remain, to stay, to reside. The first time it's used is there in verse 4 where Jesus says, abide in me. And he keeps saying that, abide in me, abide in the vine, him. That's the key, abiding in him. Everything else in this passage is going to be related to that concept of abiding in Jesus Christ. Remaining in Christ, staying in Christ. In order to remain in Christ, you have to at least be in Christ, right, to begin with. It goes... Without saying, although I said it, you have to be saved first to be able to stay and remain in Christ. And you notice in verse 6, it lets us know not everyone in this world is in Christ. Verse 6 says, if anyone does not abide in me, he's thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. These people there are not abiding in Christ. They're not in Christ and they're burned in the fire, it says. What's he picturing? Hell, it's often referred to as a fire, a literal place of God's wrath being poured out on sinners who have not trusted in his son. These people, though, if you notice in the context, they're connected with Jesus in some way. Maybe they go to church every, every week, maybe once in a great while. Maybe they said the sinner's prayer 3,000 times. And they think that's going to get me just repeating the magical words, whatever it will be. They're connected with Jesus in some way, it seems, but they're not in him. They don't know him. Now, some may think this is someone that loses their salvation. I don't think it's the case because you have to deal with texts like John 10, 28, which Jesus says of Christians this, I give them eternal life, okay, they become Christians, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. 
John 6, 39. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I lose nothing of all that he has given me, but I raise it up on the last day. Romans 8, what shall separate us from the love of God? Nothing, not even you. Romans 8, 28, precious promise, probably we all love. And we know that for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose, all things work together for their good. You losing your salvation is not going to work for your good. And there's many more. But as Jesus says in Matthew 7, not everyone who says they know him actually do. That's a scary thing, isn't it? Not everyone who says, I'm abiding in Christ, I love Christ, I've given my heart to Christ, I've given my life to Christ, whatever it may be, I'm in Christ. Not all of them are actually in Jesus Christ. And if you right now are saying, well, what if that's me? I always point people to 1 John in those cases. The book of 1 John, John tells us what that's about. When 1 John 5, 13, he says this, I write these things to you, the book of 1 John, who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. It's a help for those who profess to know Jesus Christ to gain more of assurance of that as you go through that or to hopefully point out if you don't know him that you don't know him so you can thrust yourself upon the mercies of Christ now before it's too late. Some will say, no, I wouldn't worry about all that. Paul would differ. 2 Corinthians 13, 5, he says, he's saying to Christians who say they're Christians, examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Okay? Test yourselves. Or do you not realize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail to meet the test? He's talking to Christians saying, listen, examine yourselves. Not everyone who says they're a Christian actually has been born again is saved. But if you are in Christ, which many of you are in here today, praise God. What is this abiding in him? Once you're in him, what, how do you abide in him? Well, J.C. Ryle talks about abiding in Christ and he says this. To abide in Christ means to keep up a habit of constant close communion with him. To be always leaning on him, resting on him, pouring out our hearts to him and using him as our fountain of life and strength. As our chief companion and best friend. A lot there, right? Gordon Ketty simplifies a little more. The active cultivation by every professing Christian of a living spiritual relationship with Christ. Again, I'm a simple man. I'll simplify it even more. It's working on your relationship with Jesus Christ. It's abiding in him. Walking with him closer each and every day. Seeking him more in everything in your life. Loving him more. That, that cultivation of a relationship. What's a farmer do when he cultivates a field? He puts attention to it. He works it. He puts some sweat equity into not earning salvation. But when you have it, working on your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Cultivating it. Abiding in him. Paul thought that was a pretty important thing to do. Philippians 1.21, he says this. For to me to live is Christ. To die is gain. Paul said, everything in my life is based on Jesus Christ. He's everything to me. Everything I do loving others, everything I do out there, here, it's all because of Christ. And if I die, it's only gain because then I get to see him in all his glory. I know him now, but boy, I really know him then and see him then. Galatians 2.20 says, Paul says, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. He wanted all his life to be about Christ, cultivating that relationship with Jesus Christ as he served him out there in the world. How about us? Is Jesus Christ number one in our lives? Are we consumed with growing closer to him? If someone were to follow me and you around for a year and just watch us all, would well, at the end of that year they say, you know what, if I had to sum up Ryan in a sentence or in a word, it would be Christ. His whole life is consumed with growing and abiding in Jesus Christ. We're often about other things in my life, in your life. I think if we're honest, it's often about other things. We love Jesus, sure. 
And sometimes we're in a real good place where we're growing closer to him and we're on cloud nine, so to speak, in our relationship with him. But often, if we're honest, that's short-lived. And then we get distracted as the world, the flesh, and the devil draw us away. And we start focusing our attention on this and that and getting our delight not in him, but in the things around us. It's a battle. Abiding in Christ is not easy. So how do we abide in Christ more? How do we get a mindset of growing closer to him? A motivation to to cultivate that relationship, right? A zeal. How do we get it to come from the inside that flows out into that? Some will say you got to keep his commandments and that'll do it. You got to follow what he says and just doing that, then it'll magically happen. Others say, you're a sinner. Don't even worry about it. You can't do diddly. I think God says something else here in this text through the rest of the scriptures. He says, look at my amazing love. Look at my amazing love. Zero back in on verse nine with me. As the father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. You want to cultivate a relationship with Jesus Christ? You want to grow closer to him? It's right there. You zero in on that text. You have to focus on his love for you. You say, yeah, I know God loves me. No, you don't. You don't know how much. I don't know how much. You see, ever since God saved me back in 2010, if you had said, Ryan, does God love you? I'd say, yeah, sure he does. Yeah, more than words could express. I said it from the pulpit many times. He loves us more than words could express. And that is true. But I have had no clue and still to this day cannot grasp how much he loves me and all those of you who are in Christ. Just a few minutes or a few months ago as I'm laid up with my broken leg and I'm reading through Andrew Murray's book on abiding in Christ is the title of it. He gets to John 15, 9. And he unpacks it. And it blew me away. I'd read that verse for years, many times over. And it was like I had never read it in my life. I say, how have I been passing over this treasure? How have I been passing over this inexhaustible verse with really not thinking too much about it? Yeah, he loves me. Because it's not just that Jesus loves you. It's that he loves you with the love the Father has loved him. That's huge. Because Jesus could have said, you know what? I love you guys. That would be amazing. We deserve hell. We don't deserve his love. He's high and lifted up and all glory deserves to be just given to him. For him to say, I love you would be like, yes, it's great. Or if he said, I really, 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 really love you. It'd be like, that's really, really, really great. But he doesn't say that, does he? He doesn't say either of those things. He says what? As the father has loved me, so I have loved you. So how has God the Father loved his own son? Words in this sermon could not adequately describe that. Or if I just sat with you the rest of your life and tried to explain it, would not adequately describe that. And we will never fully grasp all of it for the rest of eternity. It is so great. God the Father has loved God the Son with the greatest love possible. A love that existed before the world began. An eternity past. Without beginning, without end, without measure. And guess what? It'll never change either. It will never change. And it's with that love that he loves you and me. That God loves us. Paul tries to explain the magnitude of this love in Ephesians 3. 18 through 19, he tells the Ephesian Christians, he says this, that he's praying that they, quote, may have the strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. The love of God for his people. For those of you in here who are in him, who are abiding in him, is vast. It's huge. Surpasses knowledge. You can know more about it, but you'll never get to the end. No one in your life, your parents, your children, 
anyone has ever loved you with this kind of love. And if you want to see the ultimate display of that love, you look to the cross of Jesus Christ, where he did nearly the unthinkable for us. I mean, God sees that we're sinners even before he created, that we would sin. He knew sinners who have broken his law a million times over would have to be punished by him because he's righteous and just and pure. We would have to go to hell unless he did something for us, unless he satisfied his justice. But he loved us. So what did he do? He came for us. He came to this earth on the rescue mission. Jesus leaving the glories of heaven, where he was in perfect communion with God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit from all eternity. Perfect communion, perfect love. Jesus leaves heaven behind, comes to this sin-sick, broken world, becoming man, truly man, truly God, to rescue us. And that would have been really something if we really loved him at the time, huh? Or if he did that for his friends that were already loving him. Or That's not what it says. Romans 5, 8 says, but the, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He came to make his enemies, us, his friends. Lives that perfect life, suffering through this life. And then lets his own creation, who he made, the hands he fashioned, to nail him to a cross. The lips he made to curse him and slander him. The materials he put on this earth that were made into whips and scourges to rip his flesh to shreds. But that's not where it ends. Because on the cross was where the worst happened. Where he became sin for us. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For our sake he, that is God the Father, made him, that is God the Son, to be sin for us who knew no sin. He knew none. So that in him that's in Jesus, we might become the righteousness of God. In him, on the cross, he becomes sin. He bears all our sin upon himself. God pours out his wrath instead of us in hell. He pours it out on Jesus who never sinned. That sacrifice where he take, took all our sin and paid for it in full. It is finished. He was forsaken by God the Father so you and I never would have to be. The unthinkable, nearly. And he did that for us. You want to see God's love the ultimate display of it, you look at the cross. Sure, his love is written all over our lives in a million and one graces. But if you want to see it in the ultimate display, you look to Calvary. And he did it because he loves us. And it's that Jesus Christ who did that for you and me, who says to you and me, abide in me. Abide in my love. I, I've done that for you. I love you with, with a love like the Father loves me that cannot be comprehended. Abide in me. Abide in my love. Seeing that should drive us. Should drive us to want to abide in him more. Seeing that, shouldn't it drive us to want to grow closer to him? To not be so distracted by trinkets and toys and all this stuff that is not bad in and of itself, but it often drives us away from him. Why wouldn't you want to spend time with him who's not only perfect in every way, but who loves us sinners with that kind of love? I surmise to you the reason we don't want to often cultivate our relationship with Jesus or, or, or really pay attention to that is because we have not grasped John 15, 9 in his love like we should. We just haven't grasped it like we should. Because when you grasp his love like this more and more and more, it will create joy in you. It will create in you a joyful life. A joyful life because guess what? In verse 11, he tells us a reason why he just told us his great love for us. In verse 11, he says this, These things I've spoken to you, that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. Joy. 
Who couldn't use a little more joy in your life? Often I see Christians going around like they haven't smiled in years. Joy is described as an emotion of great happiness and pleasure, a delight. And Jesus says, I've said these things to you because I want your joy to be full. My joy, me, in you, and your joy to just be overflowing, full. You see, Jesus doesn't want you to get saved. And then just live your life waiting to be raptured out of here necessarily. He doesn't want you just to humdrum, sad and upset, and just, man, it just bites. I love Jesus, but I can't wait to get out of here. Now, there is a good longing to get out of here and see him in his unbridled presence, sure. But he wants us to live a joyful life. You say, well, my life's hard. So it doesn't include me. Oh, it includes you. It does include you. Because guess what? That doesn't mean a joyful life, things go well for you. Doesn't mean that. What did Jesus say? Follow me and things will go well. Every day is a Friday. Your best life now. The book titles on and on with smiling preachers making millions from your money. Telling you lies. You know who I'm talking about. Many others like them. He says, follow me, take up your cross and follow me. If you follow Jesus Christ, you will suffer for him in some way. We don't even know what that is in this this country, really, as people die every day because they're Christians across this world. In jails right now. For Christ, it's just hard to fathom. But no matter what happens in your life, we're to have joy. Because look at Jesus in Hebrews 12, 2. As he's ready to face the cross, it says, it says this about him. For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. Jesus went through the most painful, shameful thing ever. And it says he went to it with joy, but he endured it. Endure, not a good word, but he went there with joy. Is Jesus a masochist? Does he love pain and shame and all that? Not at all. The pain and the shame was not what made him joyous. Then what was it? It was a delight in God the Father to do his will, to bring him glory and his delight in us as well. His great love for us, knowing that as he goes to the cross and he does what he's going to do there, as horrible as it was, it would purchase us. It would redeem us. He would be able to forgive us. He would purchase us heaven with his own blood. He was looking to the end results. He was looking to who he loved, God and us. when you love someone that much as he loves us with that love that the fathers loved him you'll go to the cross to save him you'll do whatever it takes and if Jesus can endure that way more than you or I will ever suffer we can live out this life with the sufferings that we do really suffer I'm not trying to minimize what you guys are going through and will go through but we can do it with joy. You end up in prison for the Lord, joy. You have cancer, joy. You have diabetes, joy. Your family's a wreck, joy. You're on vacation and things are going well, joy. Not because of those things, not because you're sick, not because you're tired or sick of being sick and tired, not because of the ease. That's not the focus. That's not where the joy should come from. It's because in despite of all of that, that anything that will ever happen to you, there is a great reality and many great realities that will never change, that cut through the garbage. What do I mean? If you're in Christ today, you are saved. You've been completely forgiven of every sin, past, present, future, and that will never change. If you're in Christ today, God, Jesus loves you with the love the Father has loved him. And that will never change. A love greater than you could ever comprehend. If you're in Christ, it won't be very long. It's a vapor this life until you will be with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords forever in his unbridled presence. And we'll be together as Christians in the new heavens and the new earth, walking and talking and worshiping him and eating and drinking and whatever else he has for us. It'll be glorious forever. That's what's awaiting us in him. No more pain, no more sorrow, no more cancer, no more diabetes, no more fibromyalgia, no more nothing like that. That's where we're headed, brothers and sisters. 
because of what Christ has done for us. And we don't just have to wait to get out of here because God promises to be with us now. He lives in us by the Holy Spirit. He doesn't just walk beside us. He's in us. You can't get any closer than that. No matter in the ease or the pain, he's with us. And he'll get us home to glory. So if you're in Christ today, you need to grasp more of that. You need to grasp more of his love for you. And that will create joy in you no matter what you go through. Because that doesn't change. His love for us does not change. No matter what changes in our lives. And the more joy you have, the more fruit you'll produce. It's an outflow of that. Look there at verse 8 with me. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. Then the very next verse, verse 9, he says how much he loves us. Then in verse 10 he says this. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Just as I've kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. And then in verse 11, right after that, he talks about joy. Do you see how it's all wrapped up together? His love, creating joy. And the commandments and bearing fruit come out of that. They're all linked together. Becoming a Christian shouldn't be a killjoy. It's a joy magnifier. It's a joy increaser. It should elevate joy in our lives more and more and more as we grow closer and closer to him. As we cultivate that relationship of abiding in him, our joy should keep going up and up and up and through the roof. As we think of things, Lord, you love me. I deserve hell and you love me. I should be loveless and you love me. You did that for me. You purchased me at the cost of your own son, of his blood and his life. Me? What do you want me to do, Lord? Okay, make disciples of all nations. That's uncomfortable, but Lord, you love me. I love you now. Help me do it. Pray for my enemies. I hate them. Help me love them, Lord. Help me pray for them. Forgive people my family have wronged me throughout my life. Lord, I didn't want to do it, but you love me. I want to do it now. I want to do what you want me to do because I love you. It changes you from the inside out and then flows out service to him. But people can get it backwards. Listen to what John says in 1 John 5, 3, speaking this very thing. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. And his commandments are not burdensome. We don't obey God to earn salvation. We obey God because we have salvation freely given to us in Christ. We don't try to follow God to earn more of his love. We follow him because he has loved us with a love already freely given to us in Christ that we could never fully comprehend. We serve God not to get stuff from him but because he's given us everything in Christ. We have an inheritance waiting for us in heaven, which will just dwarf the biggest billionaire on this earth. They have nothing when you have Christ. He loves us. Understanding how much he loves us. That's why John 15, 9 is so important. We'll increase your joy, and out of that will just flow fruit. Not perfect, you're still a sinner but will flow fruit. So I got to ask you, as you look at your life, as I look at my life, are we lacking in fruit for God? Are his commands burdensome to you? Go make disciples of all nations. Do you say, ah, oh, I don't want to do that. I'd rather sit on the porch with my feet propped up. I'd rather talk about the Steelers game and never get to the good stuff, Christ. I'd rather be liked and them go to hell than for me to ever be looked down upon. Been there, I've been there. When's the last time you witnessed to someone? When's the last time you told someone what Jesus Christ has done for sinners like you and me? When's the last time you loved the unlovable in your life? When's the last time you forgave the unforgivable? When's the last time you prayed for those you can't stand? When's the last time you gave money 
to someone or sacrificed your time for someone that wasn't just extra and no hurt, but cost you something to love them and love God. When's the last time you just spent time with the Lord? For an hour or so. Just basking in his presence. Just telling him how great he is. Just listening to him. Just spending time with him. Cultivating that relationship with him. If it's been a while, it's because you need to grasp more of his love for you. You need to grasp John 15, 9 more and other texts that talk about his great love for you. You're not looking at the cross enough or as you do, you're just passing by it. You're not gazing into it and seeing what that really means for you. You don't understand as I have not understand for a long time and still need to grow in knowing and appreciating and being thankful for how much he loves me. As Jesus said in John 15, 9, as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide, stay, remain, reside in my love. Concentrate on it. Let's pray. Lord God, we need your help for that. Lord, open up our hearts to understand more of your love for us. As we come to communion now, Lord, may your presence just fill our hearts, this place. And as we go home, we long to commune with you, Lord. Put it on our minds and our hearts each and every day. Lord, draw us near to you. We're so weak. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.